Echoes of the Past is without a doubt one of the biggest episodes of the Owl House thus far, as its story is one that has been set in motion since the beginning of the series. King has always been an enigma within our main cast of characters, as his provided origin story has been questionable at best. Are we really supposed to believe this tiny little Pokemon used to be a hulking beast that commanded an army of minions? We're finally able to confront this backstory and King's delusions of grandeur head on. And in doing so, we may have received answers, but we're walking away with even more questions. As always, let's run through this episode for any details you may have missed, and moments that demand closer inspection, with the bigger picture appearing a smidge clearer than it did before. Of course, spoilers ahead. And to stay in the loop of all things Owl House, and the current happenings of animation in general, please be sure to throw this video a like and subscribe to the Roundtable. With all that said, let's dive in. Wasting no time to blow our minds, Luz is seen experimenting with glyph magic and different combinations, utilizing a combination of three unspecified glyphs to create an invisibility spell, which only lasts for however long Luz can hold her breath. Still, this is a huge thing to casually drop at the start of the episode. Although we don't get a good look at the particular glyphs that the spell is composed of, it seems that Luz's notes state that the placements of the glyphs within the combination can result in different meanings or actions. So perhaps a light glyph being on top of a combination yields different results than a light glyph being at the bottom. Luz's notes also list that a light glyph can serve as a power source, can reflect, and can also produce color. Or at least, those are her speculations, which I think may be a solid hypothesis, based off not only previous instances of light magic in the series, but because of this invisibility spell. Assuming a light glyph is prominent in this combination, which I wouldn't see why not, Luz may be manipulating light itself to alter her physical or perceived appearance. This actually has a little bit of science behind it. According to physicscentral.com, Making something appear invisible means that your eyes, or some detector, can't detect it. Consider what it takes to see something. When you see things, light from the object you are viewing enters your eyes and interacts with the rods and cones in your eyes. The color the object appears depends on the frequency of the light entering your eyes, the hardware in your eyes, cones, and what your brain does with this information. To see something, light from it must enter your eyes and interact with the hardware, rods and cones, in your eyes, which sends a signal to your brain and you perceive something. For something to be invisible, all we need to do is make the light from an object not enter our eyes, a detector, and not get absorbed by the object. If all the light gets transmitted through the object, without scattering, then we don't see it. If the light gets bent around the object rather than reflecting off of it, or the light reflects off the object in such a way that it does not get into a detector, then we cannot see it. If the reflected light from the object enters our eyes but cannot be distinguished from the surrounding objects, then it is camouflaged and we cannot see it. In all these cases, the object is invisible or cloaked. The ideal cloak has the light bent around the object so you can see what is directly on the other side of the object, without ever seeing the object in front of you. I believe this is more or less how Luz is managing the invisibility spell, the glyph combination bending light to cloak her. After all, Lilith said glyphs command the magic around the user, so Luz is commanding the light to shield her from being perceived. I wish I had an invisibility glyph. And I believe this would actually be classified as an illusion spell, all things considered. Is this not an illusion of sorts? Does this not align with the other array of spells that characters like Gus can perform? Already, they're showing off how the elements evolved into the Nine Covens we have today, and I am loving it. Lilith unintentionally spits some of that revisionist history that Bellows has deeply embedded into the Boiling Isles, stating that there's no such thing as a king of demons, and that demons were never unified under a single rule until Emperor Bellows came into the picture. Now, like a few things pertaining to the history of Emperor Bellows, this doesn't really add up, especially to me since, as far as we know, Bellows' arrival to the demon realm saw him persuade witches to follow his rule, as they're the ones who are capable of casting magic. Why would demons have any reason to obey him? Aside from fear, which I'm sure he enforced. Regardless, Lilith shortly finds out firsthand that what she was taught doesn't exactly align with reality. King and Lilith engage in a Thanksgiving dinner argument, settling the beef of a trip to King's Proclaimed Castle, giving us the disturbing sight to behold that is Porta Hootie, confirming in the process that the Owl House really is his body, I guess? Or at least an extension of it. There's exposed organs in the door 
What are you, Hootie? Who made you? Maybe we'll get answers in Keeping Up Appearances. The episode that features we believe to be Ida's mother, as a family relative makes a visit to the Owl House. I don't know. Maybe Mama Clawthorn knows how Ida got this place. Maybe it was passed down to her. Maybe its construction was a family effort. Either way, I have to see how this freak of nature was made. As the gang approaches King's mysterious origin, Lilith remarks that the island isn't documented on any maps, only for King to retort that it's always been there when he looked for it. I have two major takeaways from this exchange. Number one, again, Bellows has absolutely revised history in his favor, erasing the existence of this island and presumably numerous islands probably as a way to uncover his tracks and stay consistent with his narrative. If King is any living example, then there could be numerous islands that were once home to all sorts of demons different kingdoms that have been effectively buried in the history books. Uncovering these truths and exposing the cracks in Bell's story may be crucial in dethroning the Emperor. Number 2. As for King's response, what are the implications of what he's saying? How exactly does this dude know where the island would be every time he sought it out? By the end of the episode, we know he was effectively born on this island, and he was taken to the Boiling Isles by Ida at a young age. So how does he have a sense of direction back home? Especially with this implying that he's visited the island numerous times after meeting Ida. Well, I think this is demon intuition. As a demon, King has an innate sense of direction when it comes to traversing to this island. I think this could actually be a part of a bigger ability found within King. And throughout Season 2, we could see him sniff out more and more demon-related things, leading into a grander reveal. So yeah, demon sense is tingling. Lilith and Hootie stumble upon a depiction of a figure similar to King in appearance, with a notable size and difference, as this guy is massive. He's bearded, and he's armored. Eh, sorta. While we walk away from this episode knowing King's true origin, I would wager that this demon right here not only is King's biological father, but is also the real King of Demons. Which, if true, is a twist we probably all figured out while watching this episode. I feel like it's meant to be pretty direct, but let's present it as a theory until proven otherwise. Another carving in this environment depicts King's pursued father locked in combat against a larger, animalistic, fire-spewing entity with an inverse color palette. Judging how this figure eclipses the demon in size, and the show's team made a deliberate choice to obscure the top of the figure's head from being recognizable, I believe this opponent was none other than the giant titan that the Boiling Isles is built upon. Beyond the obvious factor of size, King's book in Young Blood Old Souls already proposed a question of what could have happened to the Titan race. And as it stands, there isn't any major connection between the characters, their goals, and the goals of Emperor Bellos. Other than initially Bellos needing the portal. As far as we know, this is the reason why Bellos doesn't care if our guys are running around the Boiling Isles scot free. Even if he knows who or what King is, he has no reason to suspect that King could uncover his true heritage or anyone for that fact, as it's rewritten history. Luz is just trying to learn how to be a powerful witch and find a way home, while Ida's working on her curse, working on her magic, and working on her relationship with Lilith. Meanwhile, Bellus is focused on the Day of Unity and, of course, the Titan. When you lay it out like that, the path of their goals never really cross. This is the episode and the revelation that changes all of that. Now that we have this potential thread, a battle between the Titans and King's people, and mutual desires to pursue knowledge on this topic, the emotional investment in the rivalry of the Bad Girl's Coven and the Emperor's Coven has been amplified greatly. Luz realizes they're being followed by a stone creature, whose limbs appear to be made of a mysterious intestines-like substance, similar in appearance to forces Luce's face before, through Emperor Bellos and Young Blood Old Souls, and the forging of the Golden Guard's blade in separate tides. These stone creatures may have been birthed by the same magic that Bellos and the Golden Guard utilize. Ida arrives, armed with potion weaponry, and shortly after evading the Stone Warrior, we receive the first piece of King's canonical backstory. Eight years ago, Ida stumbled upon this mysterious island while on the land from the Emperor's Coven. Seeking shelter, she entered through the key-shaped door of this tower and crossed paths with a young king. King was happy to embrace Ida, but King's caretaker, one of the stone creatures, was quick to attack Ida, under the impression that she was a threat to King. As Ida and King escaped, this creature would make an attempt on Ida's life, piercing off a fragment of King's horn instead. So now we know what was going on there. Once Ida took King home and got acquainted with his more sadistic tendencies, she would give him his iconic name and feed into the illusion of him being a true king with an army of his own in order to appease his happiness. 
King doesn't handle this revelation all too well, only spiraling further once he makes contact with his severed horn, experiencing a surge of memories that overwhelms and breaks him, causing him to retreat into the island's forest. Luz comforts King, who's found sitting alone on a log along the beach shore. If this imagery seems familiar, it's because this exact scene was depicted in the season 2 credits, with the addition of King's father parallel to him. This is a key moment in the season's narrative. Luz realizes that pieces of King's story remain unexplained, and that answers may lie in the shaft atop of the tower. So checking out the quota of one fluidly animated action sequence per episode, the gang strikes back with an ambush on Little Stony. first with a potion grenade with a cheeky note from Ida, followed by evasion through the invisibility glyphs and machine gun hootie. Arriving at the top of the shaft, King comes face to face with the shell he hatched out of, Lilith piecing together that the creature pursuing them was created to protect something in the room. That's something, of course, being King, who now has the confidence to place the broken horn back on his head, receiving more answers to his complicated history. In the second, chronologically earlier piece of King's backstory, while he remained unhatched, he heard a loud roar followed by a mighty crash, which I believe may be the great battle between his father and the Titan, followed by the Titan's demise. King says the roar meant son, so I imagine the Titan being slain may have actually been a result of King's father taking a stand to protect his child. King returned to sleep and subsequently emerged, he came into contact with the stone creature, who promptly carried King down to explore the environment. Said stone creature is dubbed John Luke by King, who commands him to back off Ida, Lilith, and Luce. And although King tries to bring him home, Jean-Luc deactivates outside the tower. Perhaps he needs a power source. Maybe it's a particular kind of magic that Luz and company currently do not have access to. Or perhaps King has to figure out how to command Jean-Luc to activate when he's in danger. Either way, King has an inactive soldier, and really, he does have an army, the rest of these creatures who lay dormant in the tower. With that being said, King has a new mission. Give it his best to find his father, if he's still alive. King also etches the symbol found in the tower into his collar, believing it could be his name. I personally wonder if it could function as a glyph of sorts, and if so, what would it mean for King to have a mysterious glyph etched into his collar? The ball is rolling for this season's story, and fast, and I can't wait to see where it goes. But as always, these are just all my thoughts, and I want to hear yours. What did you think of this episode? How do you feel about King's origin story? Do you believe his father could be the actual King of Demons? And do you believe he was locked in combat against the Titan? Or could it even be the other way around, that King's father was none other than the Titan? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, or tweet them over at RoundtableVids, and you can find me at Vox. We're also on Instagram. Help learn to grow by either becoming a member of this channel or supporting us over at Patreon. Link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please order a like and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day. See ya!